Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to be with everyone here this evening. Appreciate the fact that everyone is here. Brother Joe threw down a gauntlet this morning, and it looks like the challenge was accepted. Uh, I'd always heard that the front row was the center's pew, but, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's good to see everybody here and, and worshiping together. And the fact that we are able to come together as we have on this day, first day of the week, it is a true blessing. That last song that we just led, Lord, I Believe, is one of my favorites, and I have a bunch of favorites, but one of my favorites, and especially that last verse, as we led it, it talks about trials and, and things that we might endure in our lives, and we don't stop believing. And actually, I believe that one of the things tr is, that is true is when we face those trials, it is something that is important for us to keep persevering, and when we believe the way that we should, it allows us to get through those things. We are facing all kinds of difficulties in our nation at this time, and some of it just makes us sad. And I think about that, and I think about some of the other songs that we sing. And that's what I want to look at this evening. I want to look at one of those songs in our songbook. Because I believe we are at a time in our lives where right now we need to have more love for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this title for this lesson tonight is More Love to Thee, O Christ. And you will find that as song number 142 in your songbooks. I'm also going to ask you to be opening your Bibles to different passages of Scripture. But as is the case with most of the songs that we sing, there is generally a story behind them. There is a reason that these songs were usually penned in the first place, and, and this is one of those songs that came out of hardship. When I look at this song and, and think about it, when we read the verses together, it simply says, More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make. On bended knee, this is my earnest plea. I'll only read the chorus once. Once earthly joy I craved, sought peace and rest. Now thee alone I seek, give what is best. This all my prayer shall be. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry, my heart shall raise this still its prayer shall be more love O Christ to thee more love to thee more love to thee originally it was written as a poem and eventually it was put to music you can look in the songbook and you can see that Elizabeth Prentice is the author of this hymn. And when you look at it and you see it, she had lived in Portland, Maine. She was the daughter of a minister. She married another preacher. But this song was written in a time of sorrow. The couple had two children. They'd moved to New York City in 1856. And if you see there in the songbook, the song was dated 1856. And when it had happened after 11 years of marriage, they had already lost one child and the second one had died in an epidemic. Shortly afterward, while experiencing great personal sorrow, physical suffering, and mental anguish. Mrs. Prentice went to her room to study her Bible and to read her hymnal. She read the story of Jacob in the Bible and noticed the hymn based on it by Sarah Flower Adams, Nearer My God to Thee. 
And following then the same pattern as that familiar song, the words, more love to thee, O Christ, came to her mind. And Mrs. Prentice began writing. She penned the words hastily. And the final stanza in our songbook was not initially completed. However, later on, it was written in pencil and printed and finally published in 1869. It was published as a leaflet for a private, dis private distribution. And it was a song that became very, very popular at that time. You'll also notice in the songbook, William H. Doan. He is the one that set this poem to music. Doan, you probably will recognize if you look in your songbooks. He also wrote the melodies for songs that Fanny Crosby wrote, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. But every song just about that we sing in our songbooks, when we talk about the fact that, that part of our worship is to, to sing praise to God, but we are to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. We devote that, that portion of our worship that we can actually perform together in such a way. And sometimes I think that it's interesting to be able to go back and look and understand what was behind some of the songs that were written. And each one of these verses makes a point for us. And so I want you to take into consideration that the very first verse, the earnest plea was to have more love for Christ. And I believe that is something that as, as children of God, is it, it should, you would think, would, should come natural to us. But I'm not sure that all, all the time it is because we have our doubts. We, we go through our periods of fears. And, and, but when we come back to it, when we come back through the difficult times, do we love the Lord more than we did before? When you look at that verse, Jesus, and look at it and understand Jesus has actually shown such a great love for us that we should love him more and more. Why? Well, in 1 John chapter 4, we find out the reason for that is that because he first loved us. Now, if you turn in your Bibles, and that's what I want you to do, I want you to turn over to 1 John chapter 4. There are a couple of verses right there as, as, you, as we look at it. And I want to look at verses 9 and 10 in particular. And you look at verse 9 and 10, and it reads, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God was, has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then drop down to verse 19. And when you sing the song, More Love to Thee, O Christ, this is why. Because of what He has done for us. We love Him because He first loved us. Still in that first verse, you see the author on bended knee. We talked about this, a position in prayer, and over the last couple of weeks, we've made mention of this. But you consider what this is actually symbolizing. It symbolizes one's complete submission to God's will. And that is necessary before the Lord will hear and answer our prayers. You see this? Hear thou, my, hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. Now, we talk about prayer quite often. You've heard me use the phrase, you know, is prayer your spare tire or is it your steering wheel we talk about how important prayer is to us and and even in those dark times are we on bended knee in prayer the apostle peter in first peter chapter 3 and verse 12 says this for the eyes of the lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers but the face of the lord is against those who do evil 
those who truly love the Lord more, those who truly want to express more love to Christ are going to be those who are trying to live that righteous life. They will drop down to their knees in prayer and submission to him and showing that he is the one true God, that he is the one who has authority over all things. And you're submitting your will to his. And that prayer, you look at that verse again, it talks about it being an earnest plea. An earnest plea. We tend to, at least with one another from time to time, we, we get a little sarcastic. We get a little flippant with, with some of the things that we say. We, we try to bust each other's chops from now and, every now and then. And, and we have poke fun at each other. But when you pray, you don't do that to God, do you? You don't pray to God that way. You are serious. You're solemn. Your prayers are heartfelt. I just want you to li- pay attention to the prayers of the men that lead publicly. And I'm not talking about the ones I lead. I'm talking about the ones out here. You out here, you know, Brother Josh's prayer this evening. Pay attention to Brother Joe Love's prayer at the end of services. And everyone who leads a prayer publicly. But think about this. It is when you are alone with God. When you have gone into your own closet and you're, you're praying privately. That's when you make your earnest plea. That's when you are there in the dark times and even in the good times. It needs to be earnest. It's the Lord will consider our petitions. Will he even listen if our petitions are only half-hearted? I don't believe so. Generally, if our prayers are only half-hearted, that means that our service to God is only half-hearted. James said this, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Peter said that the righteous would be heard by God. And so when the righteous pray, there is benefit to it. So when you look at your lives and you look at 2020, And now that you know that the author of this song song, lost a child to an epidemic, 2020, maybe it doesn't look so bad, but lives are being lost. And how are we reacting? Are we going to our God more earnestly in prayer? Are we crying out more love to thee, O Christ? More love to thee. More love to thee. The second verse of this psalm. It points out, again, more love to Christ more than anything else in the love. In the world, we must love him more than anything else. Does he have the place of preeminence in our lives that God has given him? The Apostle Paul talked about him as having the preeminence. Have we truly given him that place? When we talk about him being the King of kings and Lord of lords, is that how we are bowing down to him as such? But what I see in this song is once earthly joy I crave. And remember this morning we talked about the, the, the prodigal and he went off into that far land. What was the prodigal seeking? And not, it wasn't just his father's inheritance, but it was the earthly joy that he thought that he could find. And quite often in our lives, that's exactly what we do. We seek out those things in the flesh that please us. We seek those things first. When in fact, what should we be seeking? We should be seeking first the kingdom of God. Many people who seek only the joy and the peace and the rest that this world offers, what happens to them? Much like the prodigal. 
life becomes hard. They become destitute spiritually, especially. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26 says it this way, For what profit, or what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, if you remember, Miss Prentice has lost two children. And can you imagine her prayer? Can you imagine the prayers of those who have gone out in the world and, and said, just give me my children back, please? That's asking for worldly things again, isn't it? But here, he said, once earthly joy I craved, sought peace and rest. But there's that turning point in this song, just like with the prodigal son. Now, thee alone I seek. Give what is best. You see that Cindy and I have this poem that we refer to quite often. It's, and I'm not going to read it to you tonight because I don't have it in front of me. I just, it's titled, In the Valleys, It's in the Valleys Where We Grow. It's in those places, not on the mountaintops, but in the times of despair. It's in those times where we, we face the challenges in life and we have to make a choice. We face a turning point in our lives. We can turn back to the world or stay in the world and stay in the valley. Or we can put our trust in God that he will give what is best. That should be all our prayer is. And therefore, what we must do, what we must consider in this is what we find in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Instead of forfeiting our soul, turn our thoughts first and foremost to God, seeking first His kingdom, seeking His righteousness in all things, seeking Him to be our guide through this life. This also means that, like Peter, we must make it our prayer to love Christ more than all the other things in this earth. Just for a moment, turn over your, in your Bibles to John chapter 21. We might get to look at this text Wednesday evening. I don't know how far we're going to get in our Bible study. But I want you to consider right here in John chapter 21 the fact that Jesus asked John three times, Do you love me? And look beginning at verse 15. So when they had eaten break breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Now I'm not going to get into the discussion because I don't want to ruin the conversation that we'll have Wednesday evening if we get to this. But understand this. Coming on the heels of denial... And now being asked these questions, Peter not only says them in word, but after Jesus ascends into heaven, he is going to live them. And really when I hear these words, more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee, more love to thee, what Peter did was submitted to Jesus. As an apostle, as a disciple, we do the same thing. We, when we enter into the kingdom, we need to ask ourselves, do we love Jesus more than what the world has to offer us? 
Do we love Him more or are we still stuck on seeking earthly joy? Or are we willing to come up out of that watery grave of baptism like the Ethiopian eunuch, full of joy and going on our way rejoicing and knowing what the Savior has done for us in this world because He gave us what is best. Verse 3. There is a reward for those who love Christ, is what we see in that verse. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry my heart shall raise. Because she's already put her trust in in the Lord. And we think about this. Even in this life, no matter what happens, no matter what happens in the year 2020 or beyond, if the Lord allows us to live that long, or what has happened to us in the past, We can sing praise to Christ if we truly love him. Think Paul and Silas for just a moment in Acts chapter 16. They're in prison. They're in chains. And they're in probably with several other individuals. It's not just them alone. They've been arrested for the uproar that they've caused in Philippi. And now we find them in Acts chapter 16 singing praises. Verse 25. But Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. How many of us in those dark moments outside of prayer actually begins singing singing brings joy doesn't it when we do, when you sing the songs that we sing sang here this evening when you sang lord i believe were you singing it with a frown on your face or were you singing it with the true joy in your heart because you were singing it to the lord lord i believe Well, more love to thee, O Christ. When we sing with that joy in our hearts, we can do this. Then, you consider that after a faithful life of service to Christ, our last breath can be a parting cry of victory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A text of scripture that is often used when someone passes away. But listen to it beginning at verse 54 and see the the hope that is in these verses. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Why? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. I see in this song, in this last verse, that whisper thy praise. That's the voice that's rising up. That's the voice that knows that victory is truly found in Jesus Christ. And following that, the reward for those who truly love Christ will be that crown of life. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about that crown of righteousness in his last epistle, the one that he believes was laid up for him, but not for him only, but also for the, all those who believe when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And when you look also at James chapter 1, and you look at that verse 12, 
Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. When we quote Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 and talk about being faithful till death so that we can receive that crown of life, that's what we want our God to bestow upon us. And we do that through faithful living. And so, during Mrs. Prentice's darkened hours, darkest hours, she said, our home is broken up. Our lives are wrecked. Our hopes shattered. Our dreams dissolved. Sometimes I don't think I can stand living for another moment, much less a lifetime. And then she heard her husband say, This is our opportunity to show forth in our lives that which we have been preaching and teaching and believing together for so many years. It is in times like these that God loves us all the more. And it was after those words that she went off and wrote this song. It was set to music to express the desire that should be in the heart of every child of God. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. More love to thee. You see, when we look at our songs... And we hear the words of the Apostle Paul that tells us to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When we pay attention to the words of the songs that we sing and truly pay attention to them, there can be a special meaning to us. And just like Mrs. Prentice, it was in the valleys that she ended up growing. And for us, we should be able to cry out. No, we should be able to sing out. More love to thee, O Christ, every day of our lives, going through whatever difficulties we might face, but always looking up to him, trusting him in everything that we say, in everything that we do. Take out your song, please. Oh, what a good invitation song it asked one simple question why not now if you need to respond to the invitation of our savior jesus christ why not now why not show him now that you love him more if you need to respond in obedience to the gospel we stand ready to assist you everything is prepared do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins, confess Him before men, and be baptized for the remission of your sins? Why not now? Don't wait. If you need reconciliation as a child of God who has gone off and sought more of what the world had to offer than what God offered, the time to come home and reconcile to Him is now. Why not do it now? We stand ready to help you with prayers and encouragement. So why not now? Won't you come as together we stand and as we sing?